Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we're just uh, connecting everybody in and just giving a moment uh, for attendees to load in. We appreciate you very much being here. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover today. And so with, uh, with the clock having struck 11, we're ready to get started. Um, if you are looking for the online information session about the sewer conveyance project, you are absolutely in the right place. Um, my name is Colleen Dane, and my role today is to help this session move smoothly through the presentation and to help facilitate the Q&A session that's going to follow uh, after our presentation today. Helping me on the technical side is Ingrid Sly with the CVRD, so thank you, Ingrid, for keeping us rolling. Um, our goal today with this webinar is to provide you with an update on plans for the sewer conveyance project and to give an opportunity for you to ask questions of the project team about what is going to be coming up next. Before we get into the introductions and the content, though, I do just want to pause and acknowledge that we are hosting this online session from the traditional and unceded territory of the Comox First Nation, the traditional keepers of this land. We're thankful to work and live here, so thank you. Our primary presenter today will be Charlie Gore, who is the Manager of Capital Projects for Water Wastewater with the Comox Valley Regional District. But also joining us today on the panel to help respond to questions are uh, James Warren, the active, acting sorry, Chief Administrative Officer, Mark Rutten, our General Manager of Water and Wastewater Services, Chris LaRose, the Senior Manager of Water Wastewater Services, and Zoe Berkey, the Senior Engineering Analyst. Uh, we have others. Um, also listening in who will be interested to hear some feedback and questions. And so uh, we invite you to share the questions that you have. Uh, we definitely have the expertise to be able to respond to them. We expect the presentation ahead will take about 20 to 25 minutes and then we'll open it up to the questions. And before we get started with those updates uh, that you've all joined to hear, um, I'm just going to just touch on a couple quick housekeeping items. Uh, one of them is in this webinar format, if you haven't had a chance to join us using this platform before, you can ask questions of the panel by typing them into the Q&A box. And you find this um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's a little icon um, that you can click to open up a new window, uh, type in your questions there, and we'll address them after the presentation. Uh, please feel free to drop them in there anytime through the presentation, uh, but we will be addressing them during the Q&A portion of our hour. <clears throat> uh, you can make uh, your questions anonymous uh, also by clicking the box uh, beside the question window. And if someone has posted a question that you think is important, you can upvote it by hitting the thumbs up symbol below. And this helps us know that it's a popular question. We intend to get to every question today, but should we run out of time, we'll follow up with information about any of the questions that are left outstanding. And then finally, as you might have heard, this session is being recorded. It's going to be shared on the CVRD's website for review again by you or to share with others who you think might be interested or want to know the information that we've shared today. If you're having any technical hiccups with participating today, you can um, post any qu that question in the chat. So this is a different window than the Q&A. You can find it in that same bottom black bar. Uh, you can open up that icon. And then uh, Ingrid and myself will help uh, do our best to navigate uh, from a distance. So uh, with that introduction, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us. Again, I'm going to uh, get rolling into the introduction into the presentation now, and I will start off by handing the mic over to Charlie. So Charlie, over to you. Thanks, Colleen. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the, the introduction and getting us all sorted. Uh, or introduce myself. My name is Charlie Gore. I'm the manager of capital projects for water and wastewater here at the CVID. I think many of you who've been following this process for a while will be more familiar with my colleague Chris LaRose, uh, who's the senior manager of water and wastewater. And the the reason for the transition of, of speaking here today is is Chris's role is to take these projects through the planning process and and plan and decide what we are going to build. And then it's it's my role at the regional district here to to execute those plans, to take those uh, overarching plans and put them into reality by going through detailed design, procurement, construction, and commissioning before handing the the facilities back to operations for for Chris's team to to operate and manage them moving forward. So that's the reason I'm here today because what we're 
uh, we're presenting a lot of uh, very um, detailed information where we've taken that planning process through the, the, that detailed engineering and procurement and, and the changes that have resulted because of those details. So I'm just going to get into the presentation now. Uh, thank you, Colleen, for, for your land acknowledgement. I also want to acknowledge that I'm presenting today from the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. So just a bit of a recap uh, for those that are, are new to the project um, of the, the reason why we are doing this project. So the existing uh, force main that carries the, the, the sewer, sewer from the city of Courtney and the town of Comox runs through our estuary and around on the open foreshore on the Willamar Bluffs. And that force main has been exposed over the last 10 years and it is at, is at risk. And so this project is very important to, to mitigate that risk. And even though we have done several projects to, uh, to protect uh, that force main in the, in the interim, we need to move that force main out of the foreshore uh, to protect our marine environment. And so uh, starting in 2018, uh, was a was a liquid waste management process again run by by uh, Chris LaRose, my my colleague, and it went and took a, a technical advisory committee and a public advisory committee, including uh, members of the public in, in the areas that that you pr represent, uh, through a, a very detailed process uh, to look at all the different options of how we could get the sewage from our municipalities to our wastewater treatment plant, and those different options were whittled down through uh, very uh, a detailed analysis of both the technical issues, the cost issues, the social issues, the environmental issues for each of those options. And that public advisory committee and technical advisory committee, which I'll refer to as the PACTAC uh, for here on, uh, came up with three uh, options that they shortlisted. Uh, two of those options included tunneling through Lazo Hill, and one of those options was cut and cover over Lazo Hill. That was then taken through uh, to the Sewage Commission, who selected option two, which was tunneling through Lazo Hill as the preferred option. And at that, pro at that stage, the project was handed over to, to my team, where we started to, to delve into the details of how to make that project that our Sewage Commission had selected a reality. And this was, this was where we got to after uh, uh, about eight, 10 months of work through an indicative design process. It was a cut and cover uh, route from the Courtney pump station along Dyke Road uh, through Comox First Nation IR1, then through the town of Comox, all remaining as a cut and cover, uh, which is you know trenching and placing a pipe in that trench um, through to Torrance and Lazo, at which point we would be uh, going to a horizontal directional drill through Lazo Hill and out to Morland Road, where, where we would transition back to a cut and cover. Now, through that indicative design, there was a lot of work in your, in your area, in the Lazo Hill area, uh, to, to analyze where the groundwater wells were in this, in this area, uh, such that we could avoid those wells with this horizontal directional drill. The intent through that indicative design was to keep the, the pipe above uh, the high level of that aquifer. And a lot of um, groundwater monitoring was set up in those wells so that we could analyze the aquifer uh, and ensure that we understood all the parameters as we were uh, designing that, uh, that tunnel through, uh, through that area, which was complicated with the, the adjacent groundwater wells and the aquifer lying underneath. And this was where we were getting to with the, the tunnel route details. So you can see it was a 1.3 kilometer horizontal directional drill. The curve on it here was specifically to avoid uh, some of the, the groundwater wells uh, in this area and to come out on the Barron Road unused road right of way that abutted Moreland Road. And this alignment was very specific to account for the specifics of horizontal directional drilling which requires uh, straight sections at the start as you dive down into the ground before curving around and then a nice straight section at the end and also allowed for a long route out. You can see here in this bubble over in the bottom left, uh, the horizontal directional drill pullback string. So 
the way that that process works is that we weld up all of that pipe on the surface and we, we complete the tunnel and pull that pipe back through that hole. And so through that indicative design process, we came up with a design that uh, was, was seismically resilient, was very safe, and we believed very viable for, for, that, uh, for that route through Lazo Hill. At that, process, at that time of the process, we started the procurement. Now, we were, we were executing this part of the project as a design build. So we took this indicative design and we put it out to the market and we're working with, with several design build contractors and they have a, a detailed design team. They have a, a horizontal directional drilling specific contractor and a horizontal directional drilling uh, detailed expert engineer on, their, on each of their teams. And we started to collaborate with those teams through a competitive process to, to, uh, to ideally refine this design and come up with a successful procurement uh, for and a contract for this work. Now, now, unfortunately, through this process, the working with those horizontal directional drill contractors and uh, getting some of that information back in from the, that groundwater well monitoring, the, the gap between the top of Lazo Hill and the topography of that hill and the aquifer, which was a little bit higher than we expected, in the middle of the horizontal directional drilling alignment, it was found that the risks of trying to uh, pass through that area were just too high. Working with each of these horizontal directional drill contractors, the, that risk for, for the construction, not for the operation, but for the actual implementation of construction of that horizontal directional drill, was with the, the feedback on the risks coming back from these contractors, was evaluated by CBID and was seen as too high, too high to proceed. And so at that point, still working with our, our design build contractors who have a lot, lot of expertise in the cut and cover, as you'll remember back earlier in the presentation that a significant portion of this project is being done by cut and cover. We went back to the, the liquid waste management plan, back to that other shortlisted item, the, the cut and cover over Lazo Hill, and evaluated the the and compared that to uh, to the horizontal di directional drilling with all the new information that we had uh, compiled through the indicative design process. And through that process, we were able to confirm that cut and cover over the hill is viable, and and that we were able to uh, compare and um, find a, a viable path through with that design. Now, I feel like I've thrown a lot of information at you quickly here. And so I wanted to kind of try to summarize this process going from that shortlist uh, back in early 2021 uh, to where we are today, which is over two years and the, and the work that's been done and how we've got to this decision of moving from trenchless to open cut. Because I can I can imagine those that did follow the, the liquid waste managing liquid waste management process would be confused when at the time, back in 2021, CVID was presenting that the open cut methodology was, was higher cost and higher risk to the community. And, and that was why we were moving forward with the trenchless. And one of the, there was several reasons for that. One of them was at the time we were trying to reuse the existing Courtney pump station. Now, through the indicative design process that I've that that I've described through through 2021 and 2022, we did a seismic study on that Courtney pump station, and unfortunately, it was found that regardless of the the pumps that we're going to be putting into the station, which we could retrofit in there, the actual structure was just not safe for for a, for a seismic event, and it was not feasible to try and upgrade that structure to make it. Uh, to make it seismically resilient. There's no point in building such a big infrastructure project that is going to be so key for the growth of our community that if we have a large earthquake, that the, the major pumping system that feeds it wouldn't be, wouldn't be safe uh, and wouldn't uh, continue to uh, remain in operation. So through that process, 
a new Courtney pump station was required regardless of moving forward with the tunneling option or the open cut option. And so once we had clarified that, that actually took away one of the big um, marks against the open cut option. As you can see here on the left here, the remaining above the aquifer uh, with that gravity fed horizontal directional drilling through that through our indicative design, we evaluated that was possible, but through our procurement collaboration with the contractors, it was seen as not possible. And so that became a large risk coming back in to, to reanalyze this trenchless uh, idea. And so once we had proceeded with our procurement and we had, uh, we had evaluated that that uh, horizontal directional drilling was just too risky. And we went back across to evaluate, to reevaluate this open cut. We did some analysis to, to increase the, the diameter of the pipe, which actually reduces the hydraulic losses along the pipe and was able to bring the pressures down within that system to an acceptable level that standard uh, non-clog sewage pumps, which we we're planning to use for our trenchless option, we're actually able to be used for this cut and cover option. And that actually the peak pressures that we are going to experience in our open cut idea, we're going to be very similar to those that would have been required for the trenchless system, purely because of the, the peak wet weather flows that we're expecting due to climate change and how those peak wet weather flows actually, uh, they really drive the hydraulic requirements of the system. It's It's more based on the quantity of those flows rather than that total height uh, that we are, we are moving through along the system along Lazo Hill. And so that through that process, we were able to, to show that, that standard pumping systems, standard low voltage, uh, very tried and tested systems that other municipalities around the province are using are able to work for that open cut option. And in light of the in light of, in light of the high risk from the the tunneling uh, contractors that we were hearing, we we took we took that through to the sewage commission on, on May 9th, and they approved us to to move from tunneling to cut and cover over Lazo Hill. This this is seen by by our team as the least costly and lowest risk project, as I mentioned. It does include upsizing the pipe to uh, a slightly larger diameter to reduce those that those hydraulic friction losses along the pipe to make sure that we are able to use our standard non-clog uh, sewage pumps that we currently use in our system and that is the the industry standard for the large sewage transmission systems. One of the the criticisms of the cut and cover uh, concept back at the LWMP phase was that pumping up and over the hill would have a lot higher cost over the lifespan of the project, just due to the energy required to go up and over the hill. And so we did a lot of work to analyze uh, in light of the, the new information we had, we had learned through the, the collaboration process. Uh, and it was shown to be very similar cost to the, the trenchless uh, uh, system uh, within, within the um, kind of region of, of accuracy of our estimates approximately $1 million over the 80 years of operation. We were also able to show that the Comox pump station retrofit was viable. So we were able to get these larger pumps into the, into the existing pump station on Jane Place in the town of Comox, uh, such that, that no major um, new pump station is required there, which, which, is, a, which is a major win for this, uh, this option to, to keep the cost down. Uh, I mentioned that that these pumps and the, at using these higher pressures are, are being used in other municipalities around the province. And our op operations team have reached out to those operators and confirmed that there are no risks uh, with maintaining and operating these equip these these higher pressure larger pumps equipment. And uh, and we're very satisfied that that this is um, this is a very viable way forward for for our operations team and a very kind of maintenance friendly system. And one of the big wins of this system was the opportunity to avoid crossing through the, the Lazo Marsh. So 
one of the the major reasons why we uh, were moving were were planning to cross Lazo Marsh was that the the tunneling alignment uh, resulted in the the force main coming out on Moreland Road, and to get to Moreland Road to the plant, we had to cross the the marsh in an area that hadn't been crossed before, and so that was a major concern because it was uh, would have had a, a large environmental impact um, doing cut and cover through a uh, heavily treed marsh area. And so this this new uh, route, uh, sorry, this new option, this new construction methodology gives us that option to uh, to remain on existing roads um, as we go from Lazo Hill out to the plant. And so from that recommendation from our sewage commission, uh, the our, our team went out and looked at the three different options that were possible to get from Lazo Hill up near the, the Forrester Avenue uh, subdivision. How do we get from there out to the wastewater treatment plant? And we saw three options. Uh, the first uh, was, was following a very similar route to what we were doing when we were doing the tunneling. So we would travel down Balmoral Road and down Moreland Road, and we would cross in the same location we were planning to cross. As I mentioned, this has the, the downside of having to, uh, to clear vegetation and install the pipe across the marsh in an area where we don't have any existing crossing. This is the shortest distance to the wastewater treatment plant, but has that major environmental impact. The second was, was to go down Curtis Road. Now, Curtis Road was the initial route um, back when back before the liquid waste managing management process. The, the, the Comox 2 project, for those that have been tracking this issue for that long, did travel down this Curtis Road route. Um, however, Curtis Road also has some significant challenges. It's a very windy, narrow route with some, some high embankments and it's and is built on sand. And so when we went out and evaluated that route, uh, we found some, some serious stability issues with, with building the pipe along that route. And again, we're building for, we're building this system for as a major piece of infrastructure for the next 80 years. So we need to be resilient for any sort of largest large seismic event that that may come may come our way. And that was seen as a as a major red flag uh, for this section along Curtis Road uh, for those familiar with the area. And the third region, the third route that we evaluated was the Lazo Brent route. Now the Lazo Brent route is is by far the longest route to get to the plant. It's about a kilometer longer than these two other routes. Um, and so from a, from a fiscal responsibility perspective, it is a more expensive route. But when we evaluated uh, the, the impacts and the, the systems that would be required to make Curtis Road uh, seismically safe and safe for construction, um, it, was, it was actually much cheaper than, than going that Curtis Road route. And so what we did was just recently, just a couple of days ago, we took to our sewage commission uh, the, the two different routes that we see is still viable. What we're referring to is the Moreland Marsh route, which is down Moreland Road and across the marsh, and the Lazo Brent route. And you can see that the uh, our with a with an approved project bu budget of 101 million, the Lazo Brent route is more expensive than than our budget, but it is the decision that our uh, sewage commission have chosen and with the purpose of avoiding that environmental impact of crossing the marsh. And so that that was that is a, a, a decision as of this week. It's it's hot off the press um, that that we are to proceed with evaluating uh, the Lazo Brent route. But we are still keeping that Mullen Marsh route, that alternate route, as our backup. And that's important to understand because we, we whilst whilst we review the the viability of Lazo Brent, and whilst our initial review is showing that it's it's it seems very feasible, there is some more work to be done. So uh, some of this work includes getting out and doing some um, some boreholes and groundwater monitoring down at the marsh. Uh, for those familiar with that crossing along Lazo Road, there's several culverts that cross that road to keep the hydraulic connectivity of the marsh. And we'll have, be having to travel underneath those culverts. 
So we need to do our due diligence from a geotechnical and groundwater perspective that it's safe to go underneath those culverts whilst protecting the aquifer, which is, which is in relative close proximity to the surface in that area. We also need to do some work uh, to review and amend the groundwater protection policy for area B. Uh, that groundwater protection policy was designed around the horizontal directional drilling. And so it needs to be amended to, to match this revised construction methodology. And with this revised construction methodology, the system will operate in a different way. So our team needs to evaluate how the different aspects of that groundwater protection policy are impacted by this revised construction methodology. And we need to go back to our commission to discuss to discuss the options uh, moving forward with that groundwater protection policy. And we'll come back to the community on that. Now, with, regard, with regards to the project, we're excited to, to close this design build procurement this summer so that we can get a contractor on board this fall. And that will allow us to also go out for the procurement of the, the town of Comox section uh, to get a contractor on board for that section as well. And trying to look, trying to give a, a broader picture of, of the path forward. It will allow us to, uh, to get um, some contracts and finalize project budgets this year, if we're focusing on the blue section down here below, which will allow us to come out to the public uh, early next year with traffic plans and construction schedules and such that we can start construction in spring 2024. But in the interim, uh, you can see here uh, in orange, our community engagement, that we ha we're having a community information session here today. We're also planning a second community information session in a, in a couple of weeks. We're putting that in the evening for those residents who weren't able to make this lunchtime slot. Um, and we, we're going to broaden the area uh, to make sure that all of the folks that are the living north of, of the Lazo Hill area, those that weren't impacted before, those that may be impacted by this longer route around, uh, as we as we travel towards the Brent Road uh, end of Lazo Road. And then we'll be coming back to this same community in in early fall uh, to to engage on on the the traffic impacts of of this revised route. We have a, a detailed traffic management strategy for this project for all the other areas. But as this construction methodology was focused on horizontal directional drilling, um, there's going to be much different traffic impacts now. So we'll be coming out in the fall, uh, hopefully to meet with, with many of you, um, to, to look at those uh, that uh, strategies that we can implement uh, for, for this area and, and implement those in our traffic management plans once we get a contractor on board. So that's my, my presentation today. I, I, I hope that we can get to all of your questions um, today. But for, those, but for those that we can't, I really encourage people to, to get onto the website and look at all the, the frequently asked questions. We have a, a wonderful team that's been uh, receiving questions throughout this process and responding to those online. And we've been tracking all of those, all of those responses on our website. And so um, in addition to, to posting this, this webinar, we'll be uh, continuing to update those frequently asked questions um, as we move forward. Great, thank you, Charlie. Um, I appreciate that overview. And uh, if we can just leave that slide up for a few moments so people can make note of the website and the contact information as we dive in. Um, there's been some good questions coming in. I see Chris has posted some responses to a few as well there while we've been going through. So I'll dive in though into those in a moment. But just a reminder, if people joined after I did my introduction, if you have a question for Charlie or the project team, please open up the Q&A window from your bottom black bar in your Zoom screen and you can post it there. Click the box to make it anonymous if you would prefer that, um, or upvote a question that's already been posted. Uh, if it's important to you and you share it, and we, that helps us understand a priority. Uh, so I'm going to dive in, and I'm actually going to start with one that a written response has also been added to, but it, it came in quick and it got a lot of um, upvotes right away. So I think it's worth adding also um, on the verbal record. So Charlie, you mentioned it as a bullet point. Um, I think it was on slide 12. Um, but it was specifically about the groundwater protection policy. And the question is about 
how and whether that will be reworked to offer assurances and protection to those with wells on this new and longer Lazo Brent route. So maybe we can just check on that again uh, to make sure everybody picks up that message. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I don't have any final answers for you today on on that. Um, as, as I as I note here on the slide, that we need to go back based on this revised construction methodology um, and to review and amend that groundwater protection policy. Um, I, I do want to note that whilst the the groundwater protection policy was very firm in in making sure that the, that we were monitoring that as it was deep and closer to the aquifer. This, this new system is going to be very close to the surface. It's going to be a standard cut and cover depth along Lazo Road as we travel through this area. And it is a fully fused, several inch thick HDP system. So this system is, is far higher safety than all of your uh, standard municipal collection sewer systems, uh, far, far higher standard than any um, septic system. So we are... The, the the confidence in the the product is remains extremely high. We, but even higher because we have such closer access to it. But we will be going back and reevaluating each clause within that groundwater protection policy based on the revised um, uh, design, and we'll be working through that with our sewage commission and coming back to the public on it. So, yeah, I, I feel like that it would be appropriate to include that in our reach out in in early fall. Uh, when we're coming back out and looking at uh, traffic management strategies. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question actually kind of steps away from this specific update, but it asks about uh, the force main at, that is currently running along the foreshore um, and whether or not there's a plan for removal or decommissioning of that uh, force main once the new uh, infrastructure is in place. Uh, I, I can definitely give an update on that. So. There, there is no plan to remove move, remove the pipe out of the foreshore in any location. Uh, the only section where we'll be removing the pipe physically uh, is through um, IR1, and that is to to try and mitigate the uh, the exposure of uh, sensitive archaeological materials within that zone. Um, there's far more environmental impact if we were to try to remove the pipe physically. So instead of that, once we have uh, commissioned the new force main and have sewage running. Uh, in our new force main and not within this old force main. We'll be flushing the, the existing force main with fresh water um, to flush all, all of the, the sewage out of it, and we will leave it in the ground full of fresh water. That's that's our understanding of the, the safe, the, by far the, the most environmentally safe way to leave a pipe like this, and then it will just naturally um, slowly uh, corrode in the ground as, as everything else. Um, as it slowly ages. Right. Okay, and then the, the next question is about just kind of degree of confidence, I guess, now that the CVRD has in this as being the route that will be moving forward. So can you give a sense of how um, likely it is for this to be the path that is actually selected and constructed at this stage, or are there further kind of planning and assessment stages that could um, lead to another alternative being presented? Uh, there, there's no there's no further planning or assessment um, on the horizon. As I, as I mentioned, we are moving to close this procurement based on this design in the very near future. Um, we have the, the wonderful advantage right now um, of working directly with the design build proponents. And so we've been working back and forth with them on this concept for months. Uh, and hearing their concerns, their ideas, and so we're very confident in this in this approach. It's it's the lowest risk system. If you look at the we all we've all seen pipes being installed in the ground, um, and this is a standard depth um, construction. And so once we were able to confirm that the the standard um, sewage pump systems were able to to pump up and over the over the hill, where we're moving forward with a very low risk uh, project. But with regards to the final alignment, I do want to, to ensure that the folks understand that whilst we, we have every intention of traveling along Lazo Road and trying to cross the marsh at that existing uh, road crossing to try to co-locate all of the infrastructure, we need to make sure that the, the ground in that area uh, can handle the pipe going under those culprits. So 
that is one of the, the things that we still need to work through, still need to do some geotech work on. And that's why we need to keep that moorland marsh route as an alternative backup in case something is shown to not be and not be safe uh, for, for moving through that area. Okay, great, thank you. The next two questions I think were presented or added to the Q&A before you got to the slide. So we might have already covered them and revisiting the slide might be our best path, Charlie. So the next one was asking specifically about what the route was gonna be for this new, um, this revised alignment. And so I think slide 10 has that map if we just wanted to um, pop that up. And then if the person who posted this question needed kind of more clarification after having seen this slide, please feel free to add a question or add more clarification and we can get back to it. And then the uh, next question, oops, sorry. I can, I can talk to this one a little bit. Um, sure. You can see, uh, it might not be super clear, but there's a shaded green area that's shown on the, on this map here. And that that's actually the, the Lazo Greenway property. Um, what we what we did as we were analyzing this, we, we thought, is there an opportunity to co-locate that new Lazo Greenway multi-use path with the with the sewage force main. Um, and unfortunately, uh, through that area, we don't see it as a viable uh, thing to co-locate. We plan to put the force main in the road, and we're doing that to protect the trees along that along that corridor. There's lots of mature trees. There's an old apple orchard, and the plan with the multi-use path is to wind through those trees as much as possible. And that's not that's not possible for a large force main such as this. So we'll be installing this force main within the road, uh, within the southbound lane, uh, which is on the west side of the road uh, on Lazo here. And we will continue on that northern side, that west southbound lane of Lazo, all the way over to Brent. So um, there won't be a lot of co-location with the, the multi-use path, but that's where the pipe will be sitting in, in that road. And um, because of that, we, we hope that there'll be very minimal um, impacts to any trees on that corridor. Great, thank you for that added detail, that's great. Um, the next question is about project costs. Again, you popped in before we got to slide 11, um, but just if we wanna revisit it, the, the question was about how much additional project costs this uh, revised route would add and then Further to that, whether or not there will be a need to redo the alternate approval process or the AAP. Yeah, so the the uh, as you can see here, our approved project budget is 101, and our estimate for this Lazo Brent route is is 103, using all of our conservative contingencies uh, and uh, upgrading our costs to to account for unknowns, and so that is very much within the the level of accuracy of our estimate. So at this time, there is no plan to do any sort of um, a budget updates. What we need to do is we need to close this procurement and get a, an actual physical, a firm price in from our from our winning contractor to really evaluate where we are with budgets. At that time, in in the summer, early fall, we'll have a much better idea of, of where we sit on budget, and that will define whether there's any requirement to go out for any sort of um, alternate approval process this year to, to ensure the project can proceed. But I'm I'm very hopeful that we, we won't need that. Um, and that by proceeding with a, a lower risk uh, project, that there's there's less unknowns that we we don't know about with with regards to contractor costing and and risks. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question is just asking about some other alternatives that might have been looked at. Uh, was the alternative of a trenchless route that wasn't gravity considered, aka a force main HDD route? Yeah, it, it absolutely was. Um, and so, one of the, the when we when we first received the 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 level of risk that this gravity, what I'm going to call a shallow HDD route, trying to stay above the aquifer. As a gravity line, but below with enough overburden uh, for the, the HDD, we looked at several other uh, trenchless options. Um, trenchless is a general term given for all pipe installation methods that don't use a trench. And so we looked at a deeper HDD that went down into the aquifer. We also looked at micro tunneling. We looked at direct pipe, which is a different technology, uh, kind of halfway in between uh, micro tunneling and HDD. And so we absolutely looked at 
at options that went down into the aquifer, but they they came with their own uh, separate risks, um, which were which were discussed and and evaluated with our commission, and they were seen as just too high to proceed with. Uh, when you look at some of the risks that that came along with horizontal directional drilling, were actually present for whether it was a shallow or a deep HDD, and with those risks comes the allocation of those risks and comes a lot of cost uncertainty on top of any sort of uh, risk to the aquifer. So uh, our commission evaluated those in, in light of the comparison of this cut and cover option, and they selected the cut and cover option because, because of those inherent risks uh, with both the shallow and the deeper HDD. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is um, looking for some technical specifics, uh, how, what the size of the pipe will be and how deep it will be placed. I think we touched on size of pipe on slide nine, but maybe there's a bit more information about depth that can be shared. Yeah, so the, the original pipe design was 32 inches. And so we're, we're really, we're, we're increasing the diameter by, by four inches. Uh, which which seems like a very small amount, but it has a remarkable effect on uh, the hydraulic losses along the pipe. Um, and with regards to depth, the the pipe will be will be following the contours of the road as we travel through the area. Uh, for those really familiar with the Lazo Road, as you come up from Torrance, there's a little ditch there before you go up the hill. It'll be a little bit deeper on the initial bump closest to Torrance, just so we can get a, a nice um, steady grade up the hill, which helps with um, the management of entrained gases and, and flow rates. Um, but through the rest of the design, it's a very consistent uh, up and down, down the hill. And so it will be a very standard two and a half meter depth trench with the meter diameter pipe in it, and then minimum cover on top will be. Great. Uh, the next question is about Lazo Marsh, and uh, they're wondering whether or not there have been any feedback provided to the CBRD from the province. They say Ministry, so I'm assuming Ministry of Environment from the province about the potential crossing of Lazo Marsh with the original plan, and if maybe that feedback has um, been one of the factors in revising the approach here. Yeah, we, we were working closely with the province um, through the the province actually has a fee simple owned property along uh, the, the section of the marsh. And so we need a, a, a management area permit as well as other water permits to cross the marsh. And so through that permitting process, we had an avenue to have a back and forth with the province uh, regarding crossing the marsh. And they they made it clear through that that they they wanted the crossings of their, their property to try to be co-located. Co so um, when we were going trenchless, we were able to, to, to show that the only way to get from the, the that tunnel through Lazo Hill to the plant was through a new crossing of Lazo March, which we were planning at the kind of northern end of Moreland Road. However, moving to open cut opens up a lot of other possibilities because of the extra hydraulic energy we have to, to go that longer way around along the road. So this is a, it's a big, posi big positive of moving to open cut allows us to to meet more of the province's uh, objectives, but the move to open cut actually had nothing to do with with their their feedback through that permitting process. It just it's a it's an added bonus. It, as as you can see here on the slide, it's one of the major opportunities that has been realized by moving to moving to cut and cover. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump to a question that a uh, written response was provided to, but I also want to make sure it's um, shared with the wider audience. Um, and it's about whether or not this change to root um, will add the option of sewer connections to homes that don't currently have it along the way. Yeah, I I, I, I don't like contradicting the the um, the written response that that might might be a bit tricky, but I want to make sure that the the connection of, of sewer, it, this is a sewer transmission main that has no connections to it. And that, that goes to that piece about me saying how how confident we are with, with regards to the, the leak 
the the potential for leaks in groundwater protection is this is a fully fused no connections through the entire entire area the the way that uh separate private properties are uh, connected to sewer is through a municipal uh, collection system which then flow to uh pump stations which then flow to the the regional pump stations and, and move to the transmission main so the the routing of this pipe doesn't actually impact the ability for homes to to get sewer servicing that's very much managed by um, municipal boundaries and municipal collection systems. I hope that aligns with the written response. Absolutely does. Thank you. Um, and then the next question is whether or not there's an opportunity to align the construction for the sewer conveyance route along with the Lazo Greenway Trail project to reduce the impact of construction for residents and, and commuters in the area. Yeah, so I, I wanted to just pull up a map for this one um, because I because we're definitely looking at it. Um, and I hope that folks can see my screen here, which is a, a map of the, the area. Uh, and so the Lazo Greenway project is, it starts here at Butchers and it actually travels along the south side of Lazo. Um, can you see my cursor? Is that coming up on the screen? I hope so. I can see it, yeah. Okay, great. So the, the multi-use pathway travels along Lazo here until it gets to sand cliff and then crosses over and you can see there's there's actually a, a separate um parcel here that has been uh, like a park parcel that's been put aside for the multi-use path all the way along here now we are absolutely going to 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 make sure that this section along lazo road is done at the same time as our project and we are looking at the potential for this section uh, through here to see if there's any synergies with timing and location. However, as I mentioned before, this the the multi-use path when it's traveling along the path the the parkland that abuts the the subdivision is going to be very much off the road. Um, and so we don't want to delay that project. We see them as very very separate and their their impacts to traffic very separate. I think the multi-use pathway that when it's built within this parkland is going to be very low impact um to traffic and i and we we don't want to delay that so i'm hoping that we can find some synergies in this northern area around guthrie and brent as well as down here between butchers and and sandcliff um but at this stage with the the section that is being built in the parkland i, I don't see synergies for for timing or for for co-location so i think they will likely uh, proceed separately okay um, the next one goes back to kind of schedule ahead. We've talked about this a bit, but it, the question is when, what is the time frame for when you will know kind of the final routing and plan ahead? Yep. So we are very much uh, moving ahead with the Lazo Brent route uh, through procurement. Um, and the, the thing that's going to take some time, I hope you can still see my, my map, is the, the geotechnical work. Uh, through here to just really understand the the ground below those culverts, how much till we have to work with, make sure it's safe to get the pipe through here. That's going to take some time. Just even getting that geotechnical work done is going to take us a couple of months. And so we're confident that when we come out in early fall, we'll have that answer. But we are very, very hopeful and we're we're quite confident that we can make this route work. It will just be if there's something that we're, is unexpected with the the aquifer proximity to the to the uh, the road that that doesn't give us a safe uh, area to get the pipe through, that's the the big red flag that we're working through, um, and that would be the only time where we would go back and reconsider the the alternate route because that would be our only option to get from Lazo Hill to the plant. Okay. Um, the next question is whether or not Brent Road could potentially be opened up um, as a part of this plan. Uh, we, we don't, I don't see the the, the kind of, um, let me, actually, I've got my map open. So mm -hmm. you can see here that the, the actual routing of the pipe when it comes down Brent Road is going to cut into the plant along this alignment here. I'm assuming that the uh 
the, the, the person who's asked the question is asking if this section of Brent Road, which is currently closed to the public, will be open. And that's not something that is impacted by this project. And so I don't see this project as uh, making any sort of decision based on that. That's a Ministry of Transport road that that um, that we don't control, nor are we impacting through this project. Okay, thank you. I see a few questions coming up, uh, Charlie, that are specific to just um, well protection um, concerns. And so I'm going to put a couple together and hope that we can just talk through it a bit more. So one asks specifically, uh, obviously has a well in the area, and they are wondering, you know, how far away from wells can a force, man, force main safely be built uh, without putting their water source at risk? Will there be emergency shutoffs or alarms, for example, if there is a leak? Um, and then another kind of similar question is, you know, how does this um, planned approach increase the risk to a well in the area? Okay, I'm going to try to try to step through those. So, so as I mentioned before, the the, the force main we are, is, is planning to be built in the road. So, the, it's going to be all on public property. So. I think for, for any residents in the area, they'll know how far their well is from the public road. That that is where we're where we're building. And, and so there's there's nowhere except for on our own property uh here at the the very um the, the end where our wastewater treatment plant is that we are moving in, into into private property. The 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 force main itself, as I've mentioned several times, is a fully fused several inch thick HTP pipe. This is the, the gold standard is much uh, better sealed, better uh, designed than, than any other pipes that carry sewage stormwater down our roads currently. And so the safety is, is uh, as it remains paramount for all of our uh, projects, is, is we're very, very uh, strongly, we'll, we'll how do I describe it? It is extremely safe. It is there is no leak spots. There is no connections. There is no gaskets, flanges. It's a fully fused system uh, through this zone. Um, and so, when you look at the municipal regs, there is no safe offset because uh, it would be safe uh, technically to be running directly adjacent to a well. And that's why when you look through uh, provincial uh, regulations on on these things they they have safe offsets for uh, drinking water wells from septic discharges, but not from um, sewer uh, mains that are running because the septic discharges is, is actually discharging sewage, whereas this is is a fully sealed system. Um, and then I think the last part of that question goes back to that groundwater protection policy. We absolutely have shutoffs. We have isolation valves. We can shut off the pumps at any time. Um, but it, but the the actual leak detection uh, is going to change with the different hydraulics and different construction methodology of that of this plant, and that's why we need to go back and reevaluate that and go back to our groundwater protection policy, look at the different clauses and how they apply to this design, and take that through the commission and bring that back to the public. So, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you today on exactly how leak detection will be. Um, Will be used within this system because it, it it operates very differently. It's it's not a deep system um, like it was planned when we were doing HDD. And I think we've covered this, but just to kind of wrap up that point too, the new protection policy is expected to be presented to the public. Was it the fall? I believe you thought that might be a time uh, that consultation could happen on that. I Chris, are you are you available to talk to that one? I feel like. We, we haven't set a timeline for that as yet. Uh, we, as I said, this new route is hot off the press and we're now turning our attentions to things that have been affected by this new route, such as uh, the the groundwater protection policy. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. I, I, I agree with that. And I think it makes sense for us to wait until the procurement process is complete and that due diligence that Charlie mentioned in terms of the marsh crossing and the precise alignment is... Uh, is completed and the, the scope is finalized uh, before we finalize any updates to the groundwater protection policy. So I think back to the first part of the question, I think the fall is the uh, would be the appropriate time. 
Great, thank you. Um, I'm just noting that we're just a couple minutes away from um, our 12 o'clock hour uh, being up. Uh, I know that the project team is able to stay on for a little bit longer to help address some questions, but there's a number of questions here. I'm not sure that we're going to get through them all. Um, so if we have to lose people as they drop off uh, in the next minute or two, I just want to reiterate a thank you for people being here and being able to participate and share your comments. We will follow up with any outstanding questions. Um, following the webinar make sure that the information is shared with all of you um, Charlie maybe if we could put up the last slide just so that that uh, website address and email um, and phone number are available for people before they log off um, so if you're able to stay we'll work through you know another 10 minutes or so of questions um, if you are having to leave uh, at the appointed time thanks again for being here uh, so then back to our Q&A window um, Charlie, will the stability investigation reports or work around that for Curtis Road be made publicly available at some point? Yeah, ab absolutely. That's um, that's. There's nothing confidential about that work. Um, we're still, uh, you know, putting the signatures on that, um, but uh, that we can make that available to the public in in short order. There's 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 no reason why we can't do that. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, I think we've talked about the timing ahead, but whether or not, when exactly they will know whether or not the alternate Moorland route uh, would be needed um, if the Lazo Brent route can't be used. Yeah, and as, as I mentioned, that, that requires that geotechnical uh, work to be done. We need to mobilize rigs, get the work done. And so we're, we're not going to know that until uh, into the fall. Um, as I, as I said, it remains as our backup that we do not want to use, um, but we need to keep that option available in the case that um, that final alternate, that 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 route along Lazo Road is, is deemed, we're just not able to get a pipe through there safely. Okay. And also understanding that the traffic planning is still to come and that there will be further engagement on that. Uh, when that process begins. Um, there's a question about whether or not it's anticipated that sections of Lazo Road will have to be closed completely during construction, um, a concern about access for a homeowner there. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we would never um, through construction block access uh, for, a, for a private homeowner, except for very short periods of time, uh, you know, hours um, as we're doing specific um, construction measures. I think one of the big advantages of this area is there's lots of different roads in and out. So, we will be, there's a lot of uh, strategy and, and looking at to, to be done. And that's why we need some time to look at that before coming out to the public with a strategy that we can engage on. And we could hear from people if there's any concerns with that strategy. We have a bunch of time before there'll be any sort of uh, construction in this area. So um, bear with us on that, uh, but you can be assured you will always have access to your private property that that will never be, be blocked off for more than a, a couple of hours. Great. Um, just recognizing the number of questions we have, I am trying to focus specifically on pieces around the Lazo Brent route. If if a question has been moved over, we will follow up with additional information on that. But just knowing that we have this project team specifically here to with this expertise, I want to make sure that we're able to address those questions um, first. So uh, the next question is about the mature trees along that Lazo Brent route. Um, and whether or not, uh, if there's an, any plan at this point about how they'll be impacted or, um, yeah, how will those mature trees, sorry, along the route be impacted? Yeah, I, 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 I've been down this route a lot in the last month, as you can imagine, and, and I've been tracking, we are planning to build in that uh, west southbound lane, which is on the, the, the west and north side of Lazo Road as you come down the curve. Um, the, the majority of the mature trees that that I've seen there are within that that multi-use path parkland and they're actually quite separated from the road by a by a large drainage ditch and so I, I don't believe there'll be any impact we'll be building in that in that lane of the road um that still needs to be you know confirmed by an arborist but we're we're hopeful that there'll be no impacts to mature trees along on Long Lazo Road okay 
And then is there any estimate at this point about money that has been spent to date investigating the HDD work, um, including the surveys and that process and what that impact might be on the project budget overall? No, we, we, we don't, we haven't uh, retroactively gone back to, to analyze monies that we've spent as part of our due diligence through, through detailed design. It's not, not something that we generally do is we, we look forward and try to make the best decisions we can with the information we have and try to try to plan and look forward. Okay. Um, so this is kind of further to the monitoring question, um, but I think meant to expand beyond specifically the Lazo area. So are there plans to actively monitor the kind of wider force main, given that the entire area um, you know, is has potential to impact an important uh, an important aquifer. Yeah, we're we're always monitoring all of our infrastructure, and so we're absolutely maintaining and operating and and monitoring uh, every facet of modern day infrastructure. I think uh, folks would be would be quite surprised by the the number of in instrumentation mo monitoring everything you can think of with respect to how this this system works and how um how space age it all looks once you you get into the 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 online instrumentation and control systems um so yes we 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 always monitor our infrastructure i think maybe the question is is referring to leak detection along that section and absolutely we will have the means for for running acoustic leak detection through the entire system starting at courtney pump station and and going all the way through to the plant it's just a matter of of how that interacts with uh, the different the different uh, way the hydraulics will work on this this new route and new construction methodology. Great. Um, will that uh, will the pipe be installed under? It says the very narrow Lazo Road, or will it be to one of the sides of Lazo Road when it is when it's actually installed? Uh, it'll be within Lazo Road is, okay. is the plan. There's, um, it all depends on where that person, Lazo Road's obviously very long and there's different uh, locations, but through the entire length that we're, we're uh, installing on Lazo Road, we're within one of the lanes of that road. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple more questions about the multi-use trail along Lazo. I'm not sure if that map uh, that you had up earlier might be helpful, but one of them is asking about whether or not uh, this new route alignment will impact um, the the route, the Lazo Trail between Forrester and Guthrie. So I'm just not sure exactly about that stretch. Um, and then whether or not that will be a bike lane um, along Lazo as well, and the importance of that uh, moving forward. Okay, let, let, let's follow the, the map. So this is Forrester here. And so from Forrester towards Guthrie, as you can see here, there's a there's a separate 12 meter wide slice of parkland where the multi-use path is planned to be installed. And so unfortunately, once you get up to Beckton Road here, that that slice of parkland disappears. And and the routing along here, I I believe is going to sit in the shoulder of the road until it gets uh you know as it as it travels along here so as i mentioned earlier there'll be no co-location or no impact to the multi-use path as it as it travels along along this road route up to beckton we're still looking at the the routing to see if there's any synergies or any impacts between the two projects from here onwards um we're not planning to, to change the multi-use path project in any way, but we may need to, to change the staging such that we're not installing a path, uh, you know, a multi-use path and then ripping it up to put a pipe underneath it uh, in another year or two. So that's going to be an important part of the analysis moving forward. And that's going to be more from, from Beckton uh, through to Brent to make sure any synergies there uh, and there's no sort of, any rework is avoided between the two projects. Okay, great. 
The next question asks about the TAC pack uh, established as part of the LWMP process. And so it asks um, whether the TAC pack was involved in this um, change in approach, um, if it's a part of the LWMP process still, uh, whether or not the TAC pack should have been involved. Yeah, I think I, I can talk to whether they were involved and maybe uh, I'll talk, to, I'll lean on Chris, who's who manages that process to talk about the rest of the process. But this, once once the TAC pack recommended the shortlist, which the Sewage Commission selected an option back at, in February 2021, this project was handed over for execution uh, by by our project team. So at that at that point, this this project to be detailed out is to is to implement the, that um, that that solution. And so the I think Chris can probably better talk to how that process is monitored through the liquid waste management plan move, moving forward, though. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Um, so we did we did touch base with um, with the technical and public advisory committee um, when it was clear that uh, we'd be moving away from horizontal directional drilling through Lazo Hill. So we did have a um, uh, a Zoom call about a month ago. Um, to, to engage with that team. As Charlie mentioned, um, we are in, in a very much in a different phase for this project now. Um, the, the TAC pack were, were instrumental in, in helping us to identify possible options and assess them and, um, and you know, get down to a short list and then and eventually the preferred solution. So this, the option that um, with the shift away from, from HDD to cut and cover um, kind of shifted us from from one shortlisted option to to another, um, so it was um, consistent with the outcome from that process. Um, the decision was made to to remove the conveyance project from the authorization component of the of the TAC pack uh, of the LWMP, um, and uh, now the project very much into implementation. But we wanted to to to, to ensure that we did engage with the the TAC pack. Uh, on this decision, just given their how instrumental they were in in, in helping us get to this point. Um, as we move forward, uh, there's still very much a role for the TAC pack in the LWMP, um, which is still focused on um, or you know, with, um, with the conveyance project removed from that scope is focused on the upgrades at the treatment plant and the level of treatment that will uh, that that plant will be um, striving to achieve over the coming decades. Uh, so there's still very much a role for the TAC pack um, in, on, on that component of the LWMP. Great. Okay, we're at our 10 after mark, um, and I know it's time for most people to be logging off. Um, I will cover kind of one, two more questions that I think will be fairly straightforward, um, and then we'll sign off. If you still have a question posted, as I've said, we will reply and follow up with information for you. Um, this whole uh, webinar, of course, will be posted online as well to be able to go back and revisit, and we'll share that information. Um, the information, sorry, to find it is here up on the slide now. Um, if you still have a question that you haven't posted, please feel free to still drop it in, even though we're not going to get to the bottom of the list today. Um, as I said, we will be full, pulling together additional information and uh, getting that out to you, so uh, you'll still be able to get a response if you post it in the Q&A at this point. So our last uh, couple of quick ones before we sign off, Charlie, I guess you've already talked about the stability report around Curtis Road. The question is whether or not the consulting experts reports um, for all the other pieces here would also be made available to the impacted public. Yeah, so the, um, the work that we've done to confirm that cut and cover is viable uh, so through hydraulics, pump curves, all of that work, as well as the uh, routing analysis from top of Lazo Hill to the plant, it can very much be made available. And so I'll, I'll work in the next week to, to get those uh, reports up on our website for, for folks to be able to see. The, the pieces regarding horizontal directional drilling is all encaptured under a very confidential procurement process. So what we're, the reason why that information is very difficult to be made public and what we can make public is we have several teams trying to win a very very large contract and they're putting forward in confidence their perspectives their ideas uh their perspective on risk and contracts um forward to us which 
which we've then collated in letters and memos and recommendations to our commission. And all of those opinions and perspectives are all protected under confidence as part of that procurement. So it's very difficult to provide any significant information on the horizontal directional drilling risks and why we move to cut and cover and make that public. Um, until the project is complete, that is very much uh, encapsulated by, by procurement law. There's no ways for us to share those reports, memos, summaries. Um, and so we can absolutely make as much available uh, as we can, and we, we always do, uh, and regarding the stability analysis, regarding the hydraulics, how cut and cover has come back on the table and is viable is all uh, public. But the perspective of, of the uh, market on risk and um, cost and the way that they perceive um, horizontal directional risk is, is unfortunately not able to be provided publicly, if that makes sense. No, I think that's a good uh, good overview. Thank you. And then the last question we're going to squeeze in before you've talked a little bit about the distance, but it maybe just for clarity's sake, do we under do we know at this point how many feet below where the pipe will be installed, um, the aquifer is located? So what is the distance between the two? So the the yeah, the the Lazo Hill goes up to about fifty meters. Um, and starts at about um, the we you know we we enter area B at about thirty meters, and the the aquifer is down around fifteen meters, twenty you know fifteen to seventeen meters. So as we go up the hill, we get further from the aquifer, and as we go down, we get closer to the aquifer. Um, so that distance is changing throughout it, um, and as we cross the marsh at Lazo Road, we we're quite close to it um, as the as just the, the groundwater and the topography come down, as I as I mentioned, that is what we uh will be confirming through our geotechnical work is that there's a safe gap to to put the pipe in, but there's no there's no uh, number to give you as it as it varies from uh probably a thirty meter distance down to a very small when we when we go to cross the marsh. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Charlie, for that answer and for um, answering so many other questions today. Um, thank you to Chris as well for weighing in and helping to contribute through there. Um, we're going to wrap it up now, uh, and we will be following up, as I said, with questions that have been left in our Q&A, and um, we will, we'll get that information out to you as soon as we can. Um, thanks to everybody for being here today and for giving us your lunch break or uh, midday hour to be able to get this update. Uh, we look forward to continue to keeping you informed on this project and process moving forward. And again, the engagecomoxvalley.ca forward slash conveyance project is kind of your best source of information and updates along the way. And we encourage you to visit it, sign up to get updates or post any other questions to the project team there as well. So with that, I will say thank you very much to our presenters and our attendees, and, uh, and we wish you all um, a good day forward. Thank you. Are we off? Why? There's still attendees leaving. It's just ending in a moment. <laughs>